Okay, so with uh, no further delay, I'd like to invite Christian Hebert onto the stage for uh, his presentation on innovative hiring, the value of your workforce. I heard Christian this morning, and I'm not going to talk uh, a very long time for his intro. I'll take his daughter's advice perhaps, <laughs> but uh, Christian is a managing partner of Hebert Grain Ventures, a 2,200-acre grain and oilseed operation in southeast Saskatchewan. In addition, he has a uh, past employment history as an accountant, uh, worked with MNP, and has been involved with the Texas A&M executive program for agriculture producers. I am going to welcome you, Christian, um, to the stage here. Make sure this works. I just gave them my presentation, so I'll give them a sec to get it loaded. Okay, so we'll get started so that uh, everyone can move on with their day. Funny story, I have never given this presentation before. When Ag Day's first phone, they were looking for me to talk about data. And uh, somehow it got out that we might do a few innovative things with our team. So they asked if I'd do one on team building or innovative hiring, and I agreed. So I wrote it, actually wrote it a couple days ago. I'm a bit of an ADHD type guy, so I can't do it too early. And I like to review it about two minutes before my presentation. So after my first one this morning, I was walking around checking out everything else go to grab my presentation when I get here, and for some reason it fell out of my back pocket. So uh, I might go on a few more tangents than normal, but you know, the, the title says innovative hiring. Really what it is is, can we, can we change our minds or look at, look at attracting and retaining people maybe a little bit different than we currently have? I think that agriculture has as many opportunities or more than every other industry that's currently out there, but we've done a pretty poor job of marketing that and a poor job of marketing our operations to those people that might want to work in agriculture. So Steve Jobs has one of my favorite quotes when it comes around teams, right? He basically says, it that really doesn't make sense that we hire smart people and then we tell them what to do. Why don't we hire smart people and let them tell us what to do? I.e., we want to have good people, but in order to have good people, you have to be willing to delegate. And in general, you have to be able to put them on the seats on the bus that they have the ability to succeed at. So if you spend time in your operation, one, figuring out where the bus is going, two, you know, hopefully setting the speed of that bus, if we're going to stay on this theory, and then three, putting people in the right seat on the bus. Stephen Covey has a great book on this that talks about basically how people really can get upset, including yourself, if all you have to do is things you don't like. Anybody enjoy doing shovel and barley bins 365 days a year? No, we all understand it has to happen sometimes, right? But also different people on your team will enjoy different jobs and sometimes it's just a reallocation. So really all the presentation is gonna go through is, to be honest, more or less all the mistakes we've made over the last 20 or so years and how we've tried to correct them, and some have worked and some haven't. But a lot of it has to do with communication, and hopefully there's at least one little nugget within it that you can write down and take home to your own farm. So first of all, as I said, I think the biggest thing is for us to change our mind when it comes to our teams. So do you consider your team an asset or an expense? And I understand payroll goes out every month. We were actually just talking about it at lunch. It's probably the one number on, on my P&L that actually can still make me shrug a little bit, right? As payroll goes up, it's the only time when, if things did go completely sideways, it would bother me to have to tell the team that they'd have to go look somewhere else, right? Because people rely on, on your business. But do you consider them an asset or an expense? And really that, you know, I'd say nine or 10 years ago is when we really started to change to realize that we can't be good at data, we can't be good at technology, we can't be good at execution, 
We actually can't even really be good at farming if we don't have good people. So they're the underlying asset for everything that we do. Unless, unless you want to stay at a size where you can do all the work, right? But I still promise you that you won't be the best at every job on your farm. You won't be the best at the financials and the seeding and the combining and the agronomy and the law. There's too many jobs to be that good at. So do you look at them as an asset? So I kind of broke it down into a few different ideas. So the first one, what I said is legacy statement. So if you worked on a mission or a vision or a strategic plan, or even just kind of told the crew or your team what your dream is and where you're going, because I think some sort of an alignment on that is lets a lot of decisions to be made. Secondly, you know, we call them core values or I call them quirky one-liners, really. Is there, a, is there a group of sayings around the farm that your whole team would understand what you mean? And we'll go through a few of those. And I think that's to do with team alignment and are you on the same page? Then we're gonna talk a little about advisory boards, peer groups, and corporate governance and how that can help with building a team. We'll go through some tools that we use with our team that I think have, have helped us at least move forward. And then lastly, you know, this theory of of maybe a journeyman farmer. And what I mean by that is, I think in agriculture, we've done a really bad job of showing the world how working in agriculture can be a career. And what I mean by that is in production agriculture. I think a lot of people think if you work for Bayer or for John Deere or some of those companies, you have a career. But a lot of people, if you work on a farm, it's just a job of which you're eventually gonna leave. You're just building the skill set to move on. But how's that any different than be an electrician or a welder or a plumber. I think the skill sets are very similar, but we've never taken the initiative to say that that's what we want as, as farmers or that's what we need. So we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So if I remember correctly, I have a video here next to explain how opening your mind can change how you look at things and we'll see if it's gonna work for me. If I can go forward today. Men's only at the halfway point. First man to bring it to me gets a ride back with Agent Carter. Move, move! Come on, get out there! That's all you got. This army's in trouble. Get up there, Hardy. Come on, get up there! Nobody's got that flag in 17 years. Now fall back in the line. Come on, fall in. Let's go. Get back in the formation. Rogers! I said fall in! I'm not going to generalize, but the first group that tried to get the flag down, I might call our local coffee shop or the elevator or the local retail when we all try and share ideas how to find and retain good people. Because in agriculture, we're not very good at it in general, right? And I joked when they, when they asked me to give the presentation, we're not good at it either. We're just less awful, okay? But what about surrounding ourselves? with a bunch of businesses that are really good at it. You wanna click that forward for me? So for instance, some of the best, you know, learnings I've had on, on people is on airplanes. I sat beside an individual one time that owned four resorts in Mexico. Do you think a rain day affects a guy that owns a resort in Mexico? Absolutely it does. Or a construction company in Vancouver? And yet we always like to blame Mother Nature on how it's hard to deal with people or move to shifts and, and it's so unique when really it's not. The guy in Mexico said to me, well, you, do you have a plan in seeding or harvest when it rains in the morning? I, everybody sends a text out in the morning, says, what the hell are we doing? He says, well, like, if our crew wakes up in the morning, 
They have a detailed plan of exactly what's going to happen till noon and then we'll change. So for instance, on your farm, would you say everybody that's on the morning shift shows up at the farm at six o'clock? All the, you know, all the drills should be serviced and filled. Here's the checklist of everything else that happened the last three days that we haven't got to yet. We get that done, meet back at the shop at noon, and then we decide, can we move forward or not move forward? And then everybody goes home. So yeah, that'd be a really good idea. Then my night shift wouldn't get woke up to ask everything that went wrong. But I hadn't even thought of that because it was just not a conversation we'd had. Talk to a guy that owns Subway, right? So he's got... 50 high school students and millennials working for them, and we think we have a pain in the ass when it comes to labor. So we're not in a unique situation. We just have to look at it different. So if anyone was at the presentation this morning, this is a slide I like to use. You know what? I think we need to understand that change is the constant. So it's not even, are you willing to change? It's change is going to happen. And are you to the point that you're willing to force change, i.e. be different, right? Good buddy of mine calls it hashtag not normal. Are you willing to do that? And it, this slide, if anybody doesn't know the story, right? Blockbuster was approached by Netflix in 2003 to see if they wanted to buy them. And the Blockbuster board said, nah, streaming video is not a thing of the future. Nobody's going to walk around with their iPhone and earbuds in watching some movie as they walk through it down the hallway. It's, it's not going to happen. Who'd pay a subscription? And it wasn't their fault. They changed a lot, right? They went from you know, VCRs to DV to Blu-rays to no late fees to, you know, all weekend rentals. They changed a lot already. I don't know, does that sound like light bars to, you know, the old steering contraptions that would break your finger on the steering wheel to complete auto steer to why would I ever need auto steer? And now we all have auto steer. So all I'm saying is that, do you want to be more like Netflix or more like Blockbuster? Because a couple of years ago, Blockbuster is done completely. So are you on the trend down or the trend up? And, and I think Netflix was willing to force change. Nobody knows if they're going to make it long term, but they are willing to change. So first of all, I said, I think you need to know where the bus is going and you need your whole team to know that. And you need to have that marketed. So I think in agriculture, as I said, we do a really bad job of marketing one, our operations and two, you know, the types of things we do. The reason we all farm is we love it, right? We're passionate about it. We like to be outside. You know, I think one of the biggest things we love in agriculture is we have a project-based mind. So there's a start and an end to almost every job. So it feels like you accomplish something. I have good buddies that, that work at the mine that say they started when they're 18, they don't get to finish till they're 65. It's a little different than on the farm, right? So some of that stuff is what we need to market. We also need to say, yeah, you work, you work really hard and see you doing your harvest, but you know, if you have a doctor's appointment or, or your spouse needs you, or if you have a kid's hockey game you really need to go to, most of the time we're going to be able to work around that if you let us know. And there's a lot of jobs that can't happen. But one of the biggest things is, as I said, the marketing of your legacy statement is in today's world, I think workers want and team members want to align with where you're going and your values. And they are going to Google you. If they see you have a job ad and they're under the age of 50, they're going to search and see if there's any marketing on your operation. So do you show up? And in general, we've done a really bad job of it in agriculture. And they're going to compare you to a job on a farm, to a job at the local co-op, to a job at Bayer, to a job, etc., because skill sets are starting to transfer a lot more. So for us, we've done some work on legacy statements. And, and really, you know, our theory is, is we want to leave the dirt, the financial statements, our team members, our community, and the industry in a better state generation after generation. So then the, the theory is, is all of our teams should be able to make decisions as long as they kind of follow that. And you want to know what? Sometimes things aren't going to go right. But if we know that everyone's at least going towards that light, they had the right frame of mind when they made the decision, then we can, we can always change decisions when you get new data and move forward. But do you have somewhere that you want to be? Because if you don't know where you're going, how's your team supposed to know where you want to go? And I realize that's a very broad statement, right? Some people might want to have it exact of here's how many acres we're going to be in this many years and... To me, that's partly just setting yourself up for one, failure because you didn't get there, or two, you're going to overshoot it. So to me, this is your, we call it kind of a north star, the, the direction that you're pointed and you're going. And I would have it out there. I'd have it on your website. I'd have it when you're doing presentations, right? I'd talk about it when people apply or when you're posting jobs. Picture is we went to a Rough Rider game this, uh, this summer with the team, so that's kind of another point is, you know, I think... 
in agriculture, especially, you know, we wear this, I call it the busy badge on our shoulder, right? Like how many hours have you worked this year? And I just want to make sure I got a couple more than that. And it's a sense of pride. Either one, it's a sense of pride, or two, it's a sense of guilt, right? The other thing is, is we really despise when our crew's working and we're not there helping. We feel guilty. But in a way, that's empowering them to make decisions without you there. We have to get rid of guilt. Guilt's my nemesis, okay? The busy badge, don't get me wrong, <clears throat> if I showed you my hours for 2019, you'd say I'm pretty good at throwing rocks from a glass house, but uh, everybody has to try and get better every year. And the whole plan is, are you willing to take baby steps in the right direction? I don't believe you're gonna have a huge change in one year that completely fixes everything. It's are you moving in the right step? So, you know, I can admit that our, our office team does a pretty good job of Friday lunches and events like the Rough Rider game and, and uh, me and my management team don't always do a good enough job of supporting it, but it's a huge difference. I remember three or four years ago we went paintballing. One of the most fun afternoons the team had, I got ganged up on a bit, don't get me wrong, because it's payback, but the team loved it, right? And you could put, pe put people on the team that don't, norm don't normally work together in a team environment that they had to work together, right? Or else you're going to get shot with a paintball. So there's little things like that where you can really build. So as I said, core values, I think is, you know, those little one-liners that come up on farms. You can go read corporate ones and they're long and they take three pages. But is there, every farm I've been to has a bunch of little statements that come out when I'm talking to them, whether it's to the team or to the owner or whoever. And, and every farm literally has some stuff that they live by, right? So I wrote down some of ours that, that I think if you talk to any of our team members would come out in a conversation or another. So 5% is a big deal. So I do a presentation on the 5% rule that basically shows that little changes when it comes to you know, yield, marketing, and the, and the reduction of expenses in fact, three five percent changes can change your bottom line by about 117 percent. So do you have a culture that you're willing to learn new stuff and move forward, or do you have a culture of we've always done it this way? The second one that we talk about lots is can't isn't an option, it's a challenge. So you're not really allowed on our farm to say, I can't do that. No, what else do you need to do it, right? Do we have to look at it different? Do you need more help? Do you need different tools? What do we have to do to get the job done if we need to get it done? And that, you know, that quit attitude, I think, can really pull teams down in a hurry. And it, all of us watch sports. And to me, that's the difference between good sports teams and bad ones is can't an option, right? They believe in where they're going and they're going to get there. The third one is if it's not broke, we haven't looked hard enough. So has anybody in the crowd ever heard if it's not broke, don't fix it? Everybody's heard that, right? So kind of the story around that is let's, let's assume you make a hundred decisions in a year on your farm. And I don't doubt that on those hundred, if you average them, all the operations in the room are in the top five or 10% in North America. That's why you're here, right? You're at a show, you're trying to learn, you're meeting new people. That puts you in that group. The issue is, is there's someone somewhere in the world kicking your ass at every individual one. So are we willing to go look for that? Or are we okay with being average or slightly above average, right? And some stories around that. I mean, a couple of years ago when we were first getting into pro drive and harvest smart in combines, I can still remember one of the operators coming out and he had had one of the reps in with him all day. He was really proud, right? He had found a way to have, with, had losses were down to the lowest on any machine and he was going about three quarters of a mile an hour faster than the other ones. So he comes up at supper and all happy and almost, you know, looking for a pat on the back from me. And all I could think about is, when did you figure this out? Oh, about 9.30. So you mean I had four other combines just combined for nine hours because you didn't want to tell them? But is that his fault or my fault, right? He wanted to be applauded for figuring it out with the rep, and yet I hadn't encouraged people on the team to tell everybody when you find something about that that early, right? Or when there's a shift change that operator to operator, you're telling people, here's what I changed, here's how much better it's working, etc. instead of withholding it all in. So is it a team mentality or not, right? And I, I kind of use the theory of, are you trying to build a corporate structure? So everybody knows corporate structure, right? From a CEO to a janitor. If the CEO and janitor both quit tonight, by five o'clock tomorrow, who do you notice first? The janitor. Everyone notices a dirty bathroom or garbage is overflowing. 
If the CEO did their job, you shouldn't notice it for at least 30 days, but maybe even three months, right? But it's very up the chain, right? The CEO might not even know the janitor quit for three weeks because it has to go through five levels of bureaucracy. Where I think on farms, we're trying to build a more like a hockey team. I'm a, sports are very similar, but I'm a hockey fan, right? The third line's no more important than the first line. In fact, one of my coaches when I was younger said the expectation of the first line is to be plus two, i.e. score two more goals than the other first line. The expectation of the second line is to be plus one, so score one more goal than the other team's second line. And the expectation of the third line is to be even, just score as many as the other th team's third line. And that's how we were based in our hockey team. If the third line was plus one, and those of us on the first line were plus one, the third line got the hard hats. They outplayed us that game. Because their job was every bit as important as the first line, and the first line's job was to score goals. The third line's goal was to stop them. Didn't make anybody less important, right? If the other team has a breakaway, who's the most important player on your team? Somebody answer the question. Goalie, right? If you have a breakaway, who's the most important player on your team at that second? You. If they have a one-on-one -on -one with one defenseman, who's the most important player? The defenseman. What I'm trying to say is, throughout the game, everybody on the team is the most important player, not just the CEO. And that's how farms work if you build them right. Everybody has their situation where they're the most important part, person on your team, but do you tell them that, right? When I first started meeting with farms when I was at MNP, the normal job description was do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. And if you don't do it right without any training, I'm probably going to get upset. And in today's world, that doesn't work. And in fact, in general, most team members like to know what they're doing and how to do it about 80% of the time. And they like a little bit of variation, which we can have on farms. It's one thing we can do way different. Farm managers tend to be the other way, right? We like 20% same and 80% different but you're not trying to hire yourself. So the number one mistake to make on an interview, if you interview five people, who are you most likely to hire? The person that you like the most, right? Why would you like them the most? Well, because they answered the question the same way I did. I didn't realize you were hiring somebody to do your job, right? So unless you want to be the one doing all the spraying, hauling all the grain, running the combine all the time, maybe you should hire somebody that's slightly different than you, that's good at all the things you're not, right? If you're a great goalie, you don't need a great backup goalie, you need a goal scorer, right? But since we've never been trained in HR, and believe me, neither have I, it's just a whole bunch of mistakes, we automatically go down the path of building a team we get along with really great right at the start, but a team of a whole bunch of yourselves actually isn't that optimal. Sorry, that was a rant, but change is the constant. So as I said before, to me, change isn't even an option anymore. It's not, are you going to change or not? If you don't change, you're going to die, right? I don't know if I have the slide in this presentation, but I had it in my prior one. The number of farms in Canada from about 1920 to now has went from 760,000 down to 165, and of the 165,000, 100,000 have less than 100,000 in revenue, i.e. a hobby. So 760,000 down to 65,000. So if you haven't noticed, we are going extinct. So it, it's not an option of if you want to change, it's are you ready to force change? Are you ready to be different, right? And as I said, a buddy of mine jokes, it's hashtag not normal. If he doesn't get a text at least once a month, that tells him he's crazy or nor not normal, he thinks he's losing his edge. He's not wrong. That's how fast we're changing. So this is a big one. I believe that you know, positivity and teamwork allow common people to, un to achieve uncommon results. So if I go to the harvest of 2019, and as I said, if you came out to our place, call it about December the 5th, and interviewed everybody, I'll guarantee we had two or three people that were about 12 hours or four days away from quitting. That's how crappy it was. I don't know, did anyone else have a crappy fourth quarter of 2019? Yeah, pretty much everybody. Anyone else look forward to New Year's more than Christmas this year? Right? Thank God for 2020, okay? 
So that's December the 6th. Now, the one thing was, there's four or five times where we worked till noon or two o'clock, went home for four or five hours and said, hey, we're going to go try combining tonight at 11 o'clock because it's going to be minus 26 and it'll go through better with all the ice in it. Yes, that's crazy. And I'm sure other people in the room got to try it. And everybody showed up. Do we need everybody? Nope. If they didn't show up, it was because somebody on the team literally said, that guy's exhausted. We need to not have him come tonight. And they all showed up and we were all in snowsuits, digging out hoppers and unfreezing augers. It sucked. But I've still heard more people laugh at 2.30 in the morning at minus 29 digging out crappy barley than I have in the middle of summer some days. So yes, we did a whole bunch of things wrong and we probably had people close. But on the other side, I think we had a team learn how, you know, how can't isn't an option. And if you stick together, you can get through most stuff. But the minute you let cracks go in the armor and someone gets super negative, that's where it ends in a hurry, right? You talk to most HR experts, they say we do it wrong, right? We, we hire fast and fire slow. So i.e. we're so far behind on work, if you have a pulse, we're going to hire you on the farm. Not if you fit into the team or if you fit into the culture or you have a skill set. Because in agriculture, we've done it backwards. We create work and then we look for people. Has anyone in the room had a hard time making work? So it's, you know, you think you're caught up by Friday morning, but you still found a way to have the whole crew work all day on Friday? Nobody, right? Everybody, there's all kinds of work, right? There's jobs that we've been talking about doing for 15 years that we still have never got to. So if we ever find good people, why don't we just hire them and then create work? It's what we're really good at, right? And would it be horrible if all of a sudden in February you actually were caught up and had to send everybody home on Fridays? I, I'm not sure I believe that any one of you could because I've been trying to do it for like five years and it's never happened. But it wouldn't be a bad thing. And for some reason we think it's a bad thing. So lastly, we don't know what we don't know. So I talked about this a lot earlier and that's where I'm going to get into advisory boards and peer groups and benchmarking is that we don't spend a lot of time comparing what, you know, we pay in hours per acre or what we use to track time, etc. What I mean by that is our, our rugged individualism, we're very independent as farmers. And that, that's, what's let, that's what lets us beat the fall of 2019. We are stubborn to the point, point of damn near being donkeys, right? But the downside of that is we don't collaborate very well at all right? Which allows the industry to turn us into a commodity. So the more we collaborate, the more we can learn how to do things differently, the more we learn how other people are doing it. If you collaborate with other businesses, how they're doing it. Or what about the idea of four or five farms going together to hire an HR manager? You can't just own it, have it on your own farm. But what if five of you did it, right? Or a joint CFO or a joint data person. There's lots of different ways we could collaborate to have great people that you might not have full-time work for on your own operation. So just around legacy statement, this is just some stats out of uh, Texas A&M. So there's a course down there called TPAP. Dr. Danny, Klein, Danny Kleinfelter started it. It's probably one of the best things that I ever did for myself or for our operation because it, it really did force me to one, realize that there was a ton of operations in the world kicking our ass at a whole bunch of stuff but also to open your mind and learn something from everybody. I talked to, a, talked to a neighbor actually after the presentation this morning, and he said one of his mentors told him early in his life, if you don't leave a presentation without learning one thing, that means it was your fault, you're ignorant, right? Because if you learn one thing, you still move forward. I thought that was a pretty good, pretty good quote, and it's something you bring up from TPAP. So this is, they kind of do a little quiz of where you're at before you get there every year, and I thought some of these stats were good, so... Less than 33% of producers set goals and have strategic plans. Less than 33% formalize a duty statement or a job description. Approximately only 20% have strategic operating procedures, so SOPs. If anybody has seen those, we sometimes think they're pretty corporate, but it might be something as simple as having a video of how to load a prescription onto your monitor. Anyone ever got a phone call from one of the, one of the crew on how to put a prescription in the monitor? used to be the only thing that woke me up in the, 
in the morning because I was, I was on, always sleeping in the morning, was monitors. It's my own fault though, I never showed anybody, right? We've got to the point where we even have a checklist of what should be in the left hand and right hand toolbox on a swather. I don't know if anybody else in the room has went swathing the first day of the year and broke that little pane in the ass guard right out on the left or right side. Yeah, everybody that owns a swather knows what that one is. And all we needed was a checklist of there needs to be two of each of those in the toolbox. And here's the toolbox it should be in. And so somebody before harvest, or actually they went through a couple weeks ago, goes box by box. Here's the sickles, the special guards, you know, the tools that are in each toolbox, checks it off and signs it. Not rocket science. We had half our team that couldn't run our fuel truck. Everyone thinks that pain in the ass. I don't want to waste any time to show someone how to run the fuel truck. So what we did is had one of the team members show the office girls. They really enjoyed it. They like running fuel trucks. But the kicker is they had never run it ever or anything even like it. So do you think the rules they wrote to teach somebody or to explain how to run a fuel truck work? Damn right. They're labeled, they're on the side of the fuel truck. We had a young guy over from Germany, never, wrote, never drove the fuel truck in his life, took it out, went through the rules, filled the air seeders with fuel. Straight out of university. Never been on a farm our size in his entire life. And we all think it's a waste of time, but think of how many times in a day or a week you explain the exact same thing. The only issue is, don't get upset with your team when you get out of the shower that night, just look in the mirror because it's because you're too stubborn to take the time to make an SOP or to teach somebody other than yourself to do it. And yes, I can make that statement because I'm no different, right? Hundreds of times when things go wrong, we call them incidents, they were preventable. And the only reason they were preventable was because we should have communicated better. If they're unpreventable, well, you can't do much about that. But if they're preventable, why? And nine times out of 10, it's communication. So then you get down into the bottom, you know, less than 25% track, key financial ratios, less than 20% have a policy for dividing earnings, over 50% don't know their cost of production. The reason I bring those up, it's really hard to have a good team if you can't pay for them, right? So yes, in our legacy statement, it says the financial statements better be better at the end of the generation than they were at the start, because if you can't get your team and your technology to be more profitable, it doesn't work. So 100%, I'm not saying just spend money free willy on team members, you have to get productivity out of it. But if you do a good job of hiring and attracting people that, that are better at things than you are, profitability should actually go up. Productivity should go up. So when it comes to advisory boards and peer groups, we've already talked about you know, rugged individualism and you don't know what you don't know and can't isn't an option. So over the last, I'd say 10 years, we have an advisory board for the farm. I got, you know, humbly, um, Dr. Danny Kleinfelter actually agreed to sit on ours. So we do a video call a couple times a year. And th those are the ones we go more high level. Like here's the strategic plan. Here's those quirky one-liners. Here's the financials. Here's the people plan. And we have Danny who's a consultant. We have our account on it. And we got a couple outside business members to just have them poke holes in the plan with everything they've learned over their career and give us ideas of how we maybe find more people or how we tweak net income a bit better, et cetera. And all it is is that safe environment for what I would call more or less me and the management team to take ideas to and have people say, you know what, that kind of makes sense or hey, that's completely crazy. But at least beat it around enough until we, until we move forward. Secondly is peer groups, but not only for you, but for your team, so same thing we're in a peer group with two or three other farmers. And this is where we talk lots about, you know, something as simple as when you get multiple combines in a field, what's the best way to combine it? So, I mean, in the old days, I was just excited if the combine could go back and forth a full mile. Now, all of a sudden, with lots of machines in the field, we're cutting quarters off because it makes the grain cart more efficient, which makes the trucks more efficient, makes the combines more efficient. And believe me, the first time we did it, we just about had a heart attack, it fell wrong but we learned it from people that had already been there. There's no reason making the same mistake again if you can surround yourself with people that can help you out on that stuff and you can help them back. We also will do visits with other farms um, that'll either come or we'll go where the office team and the operations team will get to talk to the same people on those teams because everybody does something just a little bit different that'll change how you do things, right? It's as simple as 
adding a new part system where you have a direct-to-farm model on parts and they come counted every, week, every month, you know, and they restock it for you. How much time does your guy that does all the parts on your farm waste in a, in a week or a month right now just on bolts and zip ties and glass cleaner? Too much. And in a lot of cases, it might even be you, the farm leader, right? So some of that kind of stuff you can pick up from farm peer groups. And your team will pick up things you don't pick up because they value things that you don't value as much because that's what they're good at. So this is just an example of kind of corporate governance. You know, and I think over time, farms are going to start working towards this. But as I said... You know, I think you've got to have some sort of decision-making structure, but that you want to have it set up more like a sports team, where there's times when the first line's the most important, there's times when the third line's the most important, there's times when the goalie's the most important, and guess what? It's like sports too. There's times when people are just being a rock star and have a great attitude, and there's times when they're down in the dumps and they need everybody else on the team to just suck it up a little, right? But can you convince your team to be humble in those situations? Yeah. Things do suck at home right now and I'm exhausted and I'm not at my highest productivity. Can you cover me today? Or are they going to come with a blaming mentality and blame everybody else for problems? Right? And is your team comfortable enough to call that out with each other? Because that really does start at the top and how you can have, start having those discussions. So team tools. So we'll go through a couple things here that I think are pretty easy to implement. Um, the first one in the bottom corner there is our employee handbook. So we used to have one on paper and it sucked to change and it was boring and Mariah's actually in the room. She enjoys doing this stuff, i.e. Christian doesn't, right? Now our employee handbook's online. So you come to Hebert Grain Ventures the first day, you get to go to the employee handbook. It goes through everything from work hours to pension to benefits to how trucks work, you know, how the decision matrix works, who you're going to report to, what your email is going to be what apps we use, so at least they have some theory of what the expectations are, right? And it can be changed live, and everybody comes in and, you know, re-signs it every year, etc. Some of the metrics, and a few of these have changed down at the bottom, because everyone will ask me on, on benchmarking, so I actually just pulled up 2018 and 2019 for the farm. So we paid 0.74 hours per acre for what I call farm operators, i.e. people that run equipment, work in the shop, haul grain, etc. 0.74. My office team averaged 0.18 hours per acre. And I realize we have this split up more than a lot of farms do, just the way we're set up. And then the third group is what I would call the management team. So that's myself and my dad and kind of our farm manager. And I put them in a different group because it depends on what's going on and what we have going on in our other businesses for where they allocate time. But they were at about 0.24 hours per acre. So once again, I used to say 1.25 hours paid per acre. We're actually a little under that now. But just on pure farm operators, i.e. people that you're going to surround yourself to help you do the work, about 0.74, which would mean that, you know, one full-time equivalent for every 26 to 2,800 acres is kind of normal. And that's if all they're doing is that side. They're not doing any office work. They're not doing any management. Which then allows you to start benchmarking or planning, right? I'm going to take on 5,000 acres. You're probably going to need about two full-time people, right? I'd find the two people before you take on the 5,000 acres, right? Because the 5,000 acres is not as profitable if you don't find the people. But when I get talking to operations about growth, because let's be honest, growth has been part of business forever, right? So you shouldn't, I'm not saying that size actually doesn't matter to me at all. The two most profitable farms I've ever seen in North America, one was 1,200 acres and one pushed 100,000. Size doesn't matter. Management matters. And how you're going to market and how you're going to grow your farm. But growth is pretty normal. Growth and revenue over the last 50 years is how businesses succeed. So if you're going to grow, you need every acre or every unit to be as profitable as the last ones or it doesn't quite work as good. So are you pre-planning for that? And I think a plan around labor is pretty important because if you can't get the work done, it, has, it doesn't matter how, what size your farm is. Profits aren't going to be where they should be. So lastly, you know, we're working around setting weekly and monthly hour limits. So we've went to paying overtime. 
two reasons. One, the team gets a real, you know, kick in seeding and harvesting on the weeks we have to work lots to basically say, you know, thanks for giving up part of your home life. And two, it allows me to go to my management team and say, that was our budget on labor and you blew it out of the water all on overtime. And oh, by the way, that overtime is costing you 1.25 to 1. So don't give me the excuse that it's, we can't, like, we don't have enough budget to hire people because it would be cheaper to hire somebody than what you're currently doing. But it causes the conversation. So it's to the point now that our controller sends myself and my farm manager our hours at the end of every week so that we know who's over 40 hours that week and where they are on the month. And we've tightened it up again that now we want it every Wednesday evening so that we can change how we plan Thursday and Friday. So our big goal for 2020 is to get to, to, by the end of the year, have a plan to be for full shift implementation by 2021. The, where, the area we have succeeded is our sprayer shift. We've really worked on it the last two or three years. And this summer, between our two sprayers, we were about 1,280-ish 1, hours. And we didn't have a sprayer operator more than 50 hours in a week from seeding through harvest. They actually just told me the other day that they didn't even work a weekend. I told my farm manager maybe he did too good of a job. We can't get that expectation out there too often, Right. But then why can't we get there the rest of the year, right? Because where we fail usually is in November and January, but I find right after harvest. Does anybody else see what I call the harvest hangover, right? You're at peak productivity through harvest, and then everybody goes brain dead for three months, including yourself, right? And you're tired, and you're mad. And I don't know if anybody else has seen this, but there's a direct correlation with exhaustion and stupid people. Hey? Does everybody get smarter around you when you're exhausted? No, they don't. Do you think everybody else thinks you got smarter when you're exhausted? Nope, they don't. Which means that we, why aren't we managing that, right? So, I mean, it's a big warm, fuzzy dream, but I mean, what about the theory that, that everybody had a scheduled day off and harvest, or at least an afternoon off, right? We've talked about this a bit on our team, and some people say, I, I don't know if I could take a full day off in seeding and harvest, because... Like, I want to be there for that. I want to be part of the team. But they all say, you know, at least an afternoon would be good where I knew I could get home to have supper with my kids and my wife and have a plan and it could be expected, right? So we don't know the right way yet, but what is the right way and how can we get there? I'm not sure. But that's what we're aiming for for 2020. So there's a couple little tools I'll talk about that, that we use. This is more one that I kind of use for me, this is the theory of, I think sometimes when we look and say, here's where we are today, but I don't know how, where, how I'm going to get to where I'm going, it seems daunting because to get to full shifts or to get to a bigger team or to get to more acres or whatever the goal is seems hard. But what if you flip that around and say, it's three years from now, we've expanded 25%. And we've got to shift implementation for the spring and winter season. Just, we, it's three years from now, we've done it. And then turn around and look backwards and say, what, like, what did we have to do to get here? So on this sheet, it talks about, you know, it talks about what kind of productivity or focus things do we need to change? What kind of cash flows do we need to change to get there, etc. But it, you're looking back to say what capabilities are different for us to be where we are. You're going to need more people, right? You're going to have to start planning how to do shifts. Something as simple as we asked our team, if you need time off next week, you have to have it in it, you know, pending an emergency by the Thursday before, because our ops manager is trying to have the plan for next week as of Thursday night, to the point that we're phoning grain companies to say, let us know what you need for grain next week by Thursday, because we're going to schedule our trucks around that. And it wasn't an issue when we only had to do 20 loads, but now we got 750 to get done. So we don't have a plan. It's a problem. But by just asking your team to forward plan, you can forward plan. We use an app called Voxer to send all this out on a nightly basis so that everybody at least starts the morning on the same page. We'll go through Voxer a bit after. So this is the other one that I think is pretty important. We'll start up on the side first. So everybody on our team and everybody that we interview goes through a personality test called Colby, K-O-L-B-E. And everybody uses different ones. There's Myers-Briggs, there's DISC. But I think it's a really good first step to try and understand how to hire people that aren't the same as you. So in the world of Colby, there's kind of four metrics. The first one is 
what we call a fact finder. So how many facts do you need to make a decision? So someone that just runs pure gun on the side of their hip is a one, and an auditor is a 10. If you ever went through a GST audit with CRA, they're a 10 fact finder, okay? The second one is follow through. So a one follow through, Christian's a two. If I have a to-do list, one through 10 that somebody's made for me, I just look at it, pick out the two things that I think are important and throw the rest in the garbage. And my theory of important is it's not only bottlenecking me, it's bottlenecking everybody else. And that's what I do. And I'll sleep fine that night, right? My wife's an eight. So she starts at one and works her way down to 10. And if she doesn't get all 10 done today, she's pissed because she's high follow through. They value structure, organization, and getting stuff done. Do you think your mechanic or your accountant should be a one follow through? No, that's how you find monkey wrenches and crowbars still on the sieves of the combine, right? Or GST audits. So it shows you how to hire. The third thing is a quick start. So a low quick start doesn't like stress. They tend to, they tend to match up with high follow through people. So if you're high follow through, you tend to be a lower quick start. That means that you like structure, i.e. 80% of your time, you kind of like to know what you're doing. You like to know what the expectations are. You don't like a lot of risk, right? T-bills are still a good investment in a lot of cases, okay? Low quick start. A high quick start, I'm a nine, you can only be a 10, doesn't really even know what stress feels like, right? So combine's going, a baler on fire in the corner and 50 loads of grain going in a day and interviewing a new person and then maybe buying a million bucks of land. To me, that actually sounds like a pretty fun Wednesday. Do you think you want a low quick start, high follow through person to be the leader of your organization? Not unless you want them to have a heart attack, right? But you sure don't want that same person to be the one that's in charge of completely organizing your team because you know what I'm going to make a plan? Kind of like the presentation I was supposed to be reading five minutes before I got here, but it fell out of my pocket, so I couldn't read it. That'll be my plan for the day. And the more people you get, that doesn't work. Right? But I'll tend to hire, if I interview them, I'll hire people like me, which doesn't fit our team. Right? You don't actually want many high quick starts. The last thing is an implementer. So if you're a low implementer, you solve problems in your head, i.e. you walk by something and you know, move that there, move this there, and you, that'll fix it. If you're a high implementer, you like to lose, use your hands. Mechanics, carpenters, plumbers, artists, etc. So once again, you know, you're, you probably don't want all your operators to be ones or twos. They do everything in their head. So a few of my operators will joke with you, if you drove by my combine cab occasionally, all the windows will be scribbled on with dry erase markers. Because I'm a low implementer and a high quick start, so I can't sit still very good, so I work on other projects, so I draw over my windows trying to solve problems while I combine. Do you know how pissed I'd be if all my other guys did that? But that's why they're middle, you know, middle quick starts and high implementers, because that's what they're good at. They're great at using their hands and being operators and executing plans. So are you using personality tests on your farm, and have you built, an, a, built a team that offsets each other? You know, that has strengths and weaknesses in each spot. The second sheet that we use all the time is the one on the screen. So it's called the ABC model. If you have a piece of paper in the crowd, I'd encourage you to pull it out with a pen. Okay? And all we do about once a quarter, a couple times a year, is we meet with the team and we go through what have you done, you know, the last 90 days. So things that would be labeled an A task. And I just have to tell you, so these sheets are from one of the the coaches I go to out in Toronto called Strategic Coach. So we're, it's pretty, pretty awesome education and, a, and an entrepreneur group to be around. So check it out if you want. But he led me down this path. So an A task is something you hate. If you had to do this all day, every day, they better hide the rope and the blades. Shoveling barley bins ranks pretty high on our farm, right? For a lot of people, running the land roller right? Compares to watching paint dry for a lot of the team members. But I don't just want you to put down work stuff, okay? So when I, sometimes when I work with farm teams, another thing that'll pop up is cleaning the bathrooms in the house or doing laundry. Because as a farm team, when you're working with your spouse, all your time is valuable. And if you could delegate cleaning bathrooms 
and doing laundry to a house cleaner for 20 or 25 bucks an hour. And that made both of you more happy and freed up your spouse to work on things that they love doing, which might be running a combine or making sure they never miss a hockey game. Probably the best 25 bucks an hour you've ever spent, right? So don't just do it on work stuff because in today's world, it's work-life integration. There is no work-life balance. Everything's connected, right? So you have to integrate that stuff. I'm just checking how many rants I've been on. Okay, so a B task are things you don't mind doing. So I could do these eight to 10 hours a day for my whole work career, for my personal life, and it would be okay. Right, so for me, that's, you know, checking crops, coming to a farm show, stuff like that fits in that. It's all right, I don't, I don't mind it, right? It's okay. A C task is what you love doing. I'm talking you could work 16 hours, you'd actually think you'd only worked eight hours, and you could still go for 24 because you love it that much. Every day feels awesome. Problem is, as farmers, most of us love what we do. That's why we work so much, right? But now think of this. If you do this with your whole team, and you have an individual that you assumed loves hauling grain because they have their A1 license. Actually, I'm going to flip this around because we've done this a couple of times. I'm going to start with this one first. We have a lot of people that put rock picking in A, okay? And we've also had a lot of office people put in A, being in the office all the time, never getting a break, would like to run some machinery. So now over the last 10 years, we've had two office team members that go pick rocks a couple days a week because being out in the tractor with the sun shining in their face and the music is awesome. It's a change from a computer screen. And my team members that were doing that before are now move into the Harrow Bar or the Land Roller or, or you know, maybe, maybe we do sneak them for an afternoon off or they, they go help the fertilizer guy that's being run off his feet. And all we did was ask them what they liked doing or what they didn't like doing. We had the same thing one time with a trucker and a, and a guy that was fairly mechanical, except they were both mechanical. One had his A1 license, one didn't. So we automatically sent the A1 guy trucking all the time. The other guy was in the shop. Here we find out that the trucker, trucking is a B task and working in the shop is a C. And the mechanical guy working in the shop's an A. He hates it. And he actually loves trucking. It's a C. And all we had to do was send him for his license. He knew how to drive it. He just technically wasn't legal. So fix his license and they're both happier. Now what does everybody think? If you're working on stuff you love to do every day, do you get more stuff done? Absolutely you do. So do you think if you could get your team working on stuff you love doing all the time that they'd get more done and you'd have to show them less? What about if you did this with your spouse and the two of you did what you like all the time instead of telling each other you weren't done your list? Right? It's no different than I despise doing things like changing light bulbs and putting a piece of plywood up in the barn or mowing the lawn. Like, I don't know why. It just immediately pisses me off. So now for this summer, we've got a yard guy hired that's going to take care of all the farmyards. Because even at our normal farmyard, we've learned that it pisses all the guys off because the weeds never get sprayed around the bins, right? Whether it's too far down on the list or they don't like doing it. So now one of the individuals that used to run a rock picker for us all the time is over the age of 70, he's the guy that in town his lawn is mowed on a goddamn crisscross. Like, he loves it. So we're just going to build him a schedule of here's when weeds get sprayed, here's when the lawns get mowed. Guess what? He also loves doing carpentry. So when I need the piece of plywood put up in the quonset, he'll do it. And do you think my spouse cares whether I do it or somebody else does it or just that it gets done? That it gets done. Right? But it's a two-way street because I think once you start looking in your relationships, it goes both ways, Right? There's stuff when, you're, when your spouse looks at some of the stuff they're doing, you could delegate a bunch of that too. But within your team, it's pretty powerful. So then when we do our performance reviews, we ask the same thing. What are the things you'd like to learn? What do you want to try next year? What are you doing that you love? What are you not doing that you don't love? But what you do on this sheet is under each group of tasks for each quarter now, start putting what percentage of your time is in each one. And then coming up with solutions of how you get that different. So if you're currently spending half your time in things you hate doing, don't just go to the, you know, to the boss and say, this sucks, I'm leaving. Go to him and say, here's all the things I'm doing. Here's people that love doing it, or here, here's your solutions of how we could do it different. And all of a sudden, that only 10% of my time would be doing things I hate, right? I call it dead cat syndrome, right? If someone kills a cat and throws it on the front step of the, front step of the shop, 
and just tells me they killed a cat, it really pisses me off, right? Like at least come to me with the cat and a shovel, but preferably just tell me I missed the funeral. Like problems have solutions, fix the problem, tell me I missed the funeral, right? And can you build that on your team? So this is one of the, honestly, one of the most powerful tools that we've used for changing communication on the farm. We try to do it, every quarter is almost too much, but two, three times a year we'll do it on our, on our Friday lunches, and it doesn't have to be right full. Have everybody fill in three things from their work life and one from their personal life and then share it. So these are some of the quick tools that I think can help farm operations and farm teams. So Voxer's up in the top left. It's a communication app, so you can use iPhones, Androids, computers, etc., to do all your messaging. So we basically say team emails aren't allowed, more or less, right? All communication between our teams on Voxer, not through iMessage, other than my dad still uses iMessage occasionally, but he's getting pretty good at Voxer. But that way, when Voxer bings during the day, you know it's a work problem, right? And then within Voxer, we've set up teams. We have a shop team, a sprayer team, you know, the harvest team, and then the whole team. So we're going to do a Friday lunch, the whole team finds out. Do you think the whole team needs to know which guys need to be at the trucks tomorrow? No, it's just a notification that pisses them off and takes them off their duties, right? So we've created teams to ensure communications with the right group of people. The other thing is, is you don't have to make seven text messages or seven phone calls to get everybody on the same page. So my wife's on the field ops team, not because she does a ton of stuff in the field, but she always knows what's kind of going on if somebody asks her. And her and my mom do all the meals for everybody in seeding and harvest. Do you know how happy a crew is if supper always shows up between 5.30 and 6, not at 9 o'clock at night? The easiest way for them to know that is what field we're in, how things are going. And she likes to know if things are going bad because that might be the day you bring to double the desserts. And it's funny how simple that your favorite meal with two pieces of chocolate cake can fix almost any day, right? I see people laughing in the crowd because we've all been there, right? Or if you're the guy in the swath or 10 miles away from everything and supper doesn't show up till quarter after 10 and you're already having a bad day, like, I hate my life, okay? Especially in the old MacDons where there was no heat, so you had a sleeping bag pulled up to your armpits too at night, right? So the second app is T-Sheets. Lots of people ask how we track time. This is an online punch clock. Team members can have it on their phone. It automatically ties into QuickBooks. As the manager, I can go in and see who's clocked on, how long they've worked, where their location is. Yes, we've got the odd person clocking in from home, but guess what? You have the data, you have one conversation, it goes away, right? Pretty simple way to track hours and time. Trello is a project management tool, so that's where we can track all of the to-dos, especially in the office. I don't know about anybody else, but throughout a day, five or six or 15 or 100 things come up, and then three months later, you remember it's important. Right? So this is a spot where we can laundry list all that, put due dates, please leave it up to your high follow-through people, not to your Christians. Okay? On the bottom, I've got Gmail and Google Calendar. So we're integrated with G Suite for Heber Grain Ventures. Everybody has their own email. Everybody has a calendar. You can book things on each other's. It's awesome. Right? Not everybody uses it all the time, but our shop manager gets all the emails for parts. I don't get it, right? We have an email finance at Heber Grain Ventures that we've set up for all of the invoices to come into. Because if they come into my email, the office team doesn't get them for three weeks. Kind of like the receipts in my wallet, right? Also, what if somebody moves on from your organization or gets sick or gets pregnant and doesn't check their email? That finance email can be opened up to different people within the organization. So some things as simple as that can really streamline. The last one is an app called 1Password. Does anybody else have to reset their password like at least once every three weeks on something? So this app, you can share passwords with your whole team that uses face recognition. Pretty simple way to have password sharing across the operation. Oh, I updated this on this slide. So there's the, there's the numbers. It's kind of an average of 18 and 19. And as I said, we'll use that for planning for expansion we we'll use that as benchmarks with other farms. So within our peer group, we've started to benchmark those numbers to see where are we paying, you know, about the same hours as everybody else? Are we more efficient? Are we less efficient? Next, we're going to do it as a percentage of total expenses and of revenue. So lastly is this idea of a farm journeyman. Good five minutes. So as I said before, 
I think in agriculture, one, we've done a really bad job of marketing our operations and what it's like to work in agriculture. And two, we haven't convinced anybody that you can be on a farm as a career, right? What if the story we started to tell is that it is no different than an electrician, right? Out of high school, you start with a farm and you do a co-op with one of the SIAS. You need this many hours of education and this many hours of co-op. You start at 16 bucks an hour, and three years from now, by the time you're a journeyman, you're at $31 an hour. And if you move on to be a foreman, you can, have, you can apprentice two journeymen underneath you, and you can make $40 an hour. And I'm just picking these numbers out. But what if we had a plan like that of education and co-op time for people that wanted to work on farms? Because I think we could pull it off. We have some of the coolest things going on in an industry anywhere. If you look at the technology we have now, some of the sizes of the businesses we have now, and the amount of people going into agriculture schools, but they're all going in for ag degrees, right? I don't know about anybody else in the room, but I need journeyman farmers. No different than my electricians or my plumbers or my welders. I need people that get shit done. But we haven't done this. We haven't gone down this path. So too many times, young people tell me, agriculture is just a stepping stone. I can't work on a farm for a career. But we've done that to ourselves. Lots of us don't have pension. We don't have benefits. We have a hard time paying what the market is. That's nobody else's fault but our own. We haven't found a way to do it, right? So do you want to be the farm that knocks the flagpole ov over and gets the ride on the Jeep? Or do you want to fight with every other operation trying to climb the pole, right? So quick takeaways so that hopefully you can take home one thing. You know, hire good people every chance you get, then create work. The team must buy into the statement, you know, the legacy statement and the values. If they don't believe in where you're going or being part of it, it's not going to work. Leverage and delegation, your job should be to replace yourself. If you think replacing yourself means you don't have a job, it's no wonder your whole team won't share stuff. If you replace yourself, that just means you moved up doing things you love doing all the time, which means you're happier, which means your team should look at it the same way. Team education and training is important, so things like shows, we do personality profile training, you know, A1 licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Not only do you have to change your operation, we have to start to change the industry. And the last is mindset, you know, goes back to the video. So lastly, I just got Heber Grain Ventures and Maverick Eggs, our consulting arm. I don't believe you can get any of this stuff done if you don't have a reason to do it, right? And so there, I just got pictures of my family on the, on the screen. This is, it's the reason I get up in the morning. Kind of my, I got a quirky statement when it comes to this too. And yes, for those of you chuckling in the crowd, I'm telling my daughter to be a nun because she got her mother's looks and my personality, which means she'll be a hellion. But my joke or my quirky statement for the kids is, I want to give them the opportunity, and not just my kids, but team members' kids, I want to give them the opportunity to go to Harvard or Stanford or whichever the university is. But we've built something cool enough that they might come back. They don't have to come back. But if they get a job offer in New York or one in Calgary or one in Regina or one in Winnipeg, I want the one in Fairlight, Saskatchewan, which has 28 people, 26 with the same last name, and it's not Hebert, to be side by side with those other offers. And if I'm just gonna do the things we've always done, the chance of that is zero. All I'm doing is building value in an organization to sell it. And that's not my interest. So are you willing to look at it different to convince them to think about coming back? What gets you up in the morning? That's all I got. Couple minutes for questions, yep. Anyone have any questions before we wrap up for today? Yep. Could I get that presentation back up? The numbers on per hour? Oh, yeah, yeah. like the corporate governance structure. Yeah. yeah.
How do I get my dad on board with it? Yeah, so I mean, we're getting into succession now too, but I think, uh, so if we go to this slide, so if you'd look at this slide on our operation, I mean, Louis my dad, so he's the founder of the farm. Him and I would both be on the board of governors, right? The ownership groups on the board of governors and, and the advisory board. And then in, a, in, our, in our operation, Louis would be on the operation side. He's kind of our logistics manager and a mentor to most of the guys. I think the reason we've been able to go down that path is, is one, I, I explain things very business-like. So opportunities aren't just like, hey, Louie, you should trust me. We should put a quarter million bucks in this. It's like, no, here's the opportunity. Here's the pros and cons. Here's why it follows our mission statement. You know, are you in or are you out? And then the other thing is, is I think we've stayed pretty aligned on our, on our legacy statement and those quirky statements. So the can't isn't an option. It's a challenge. Louie heard it on a Ford commercial. And we, we don't like Ford, don't get me wrong. We're GM guys, right? But it resonated with him to the point that he came the next morning to, to, bre- to coffee, said, ah, this fits us. This is the way we are. Automatically, it went into our value statement. So I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the legacy statement and the values have stayed extremely consistent between him and I. I also think the other thing is, and I give him credit for it, is he didn't, he didn't train his son to be him, right? So he realized early that what I loved doing was business and risk and finance and dreaming, right? And so I, I was never encouraged to take an agronomy degree or something like that. In fact, I took medicine my first year, wrote the MCAT, did the interview and said, what am I doing? Came home and said, I'm going to go take agronomy. And my dad said, no, 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 go, go take a business degree because that's the part I'm getting sick of. So we were able to have areas that we're both in charge of that we love doing. So we're in our love a lot more and we're not stepping on our feet. And then the third point I would say just from experience is that it's actually been easier as we've got bigger. So there's certain sizes where if you have two leaders, they're beside each other all the time. That equates to butting heads because depending on the task, one of them should be the leader and the other should be the follower. But if you're a leader, you're, It's really tough to sometimes follow, right? But now we have so much stuff going on. Like there's no, we don't butt heads very often at all because we both have to run at 100% capacity to get done what needs to get done. So it's just, it's blind trust and updates kind of weekly to ensure that we get there. But I mean, I I also, you know, for anyone that knows Louie, he's a bit of a stubborn individual too. I come by it honestly, but I mean, I got a 59 year old dad that's trapped in a 42 year old's body. So I mean, he still works hard. He still loves what we're doing. And, and he, he, I think he's more, I think he loves farming now more than he ever has because he likes growth and he likes challenge. And, and don't get me wrong, sorry for anybody that's around the same vintage. I wouldn't say the strength of that group of people is, is dealing with team members, right? They, they spent most of their life trying to be, around, be by themselves, not by surrounding themselves with people. But he's also learned that team members will do a lot of stuff that he doesn't like doing, right? And so slowly you kind of move into a, in a mentorship type role. Some days it's easy, some days it's not. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Um, if we could just give a round of appreciation for Christian this day.